November 9th, 1902, Volume 4 Difference Between the Operating of Jesus and the Operating of Man While I was longing for my adorable Jesus, he came in the appearance he had when his enemies were slapping him, covering his face with spit, and blindfolding him. With admirable patience he suffered everything, even more, it seemed he would not even look at them, so much was he intent in his interior on looking at the fruit which those sufferings would produce. I admired everything with amazement, and Jesus told me, My daughter, in my operating and suffering, I never looked outside, but always inside, and whatever it might be in seeing its fruit, I would not just suffer it, but I would suffer everything with yearning and avidity. On the other hand, completely opposite, man in operating good does not look inside the work, and not seeing its fruit, he becomes easily bored. Everything bothers him, and many times he neglects doing good. If he suffers, he easily loses his patience, and if he does evil, not looking inside that evil, he does it with ease. Then he added, Creatures do not want to convince themselves that life must be accompanied by various circumstances, now of sufferings, now of consolation. Yet even plants and flowers give them an example of this by remaining submitted to winds, snows, hail, and heat. November 9, 1906, Volume 7, Effects of Meditating Continuously on the Passion Finding myself in my usual state, I was thinking about the passion of our Lord. And while I was doing this, he came and told me, My daughter, one who meditates continuously on my passion and feels sorrow for it and compassion for me, pleases me so much that I feel as though comforted for all that I suffered in the course of my passion. And by always meditating on it, the soul arrives at preparing a continuous food. In this food there are many different spices and flavors, which form different effects. So if in the course of my passion they gave me ropes and chains to tie me, the soul releases me and gives me freedom. They despised me, spat on me, and dishonored me. She appreciates me, cleans me of that spittle, and honors me. They stripped me and scourged me. She heals me and clothes me. They crowned me with thorns, mocking me as king, embittered my mouth with bile, and crucified me. While the soul meditating on all my pains, crowns me with glory and honors me as her king, fills my mouth with sweetness, giving me the most delicious food, which is the memory of my own works, and unnailing me from the cross, she makes me rise again in her heart. And every time she does so, I give her a new life of grace as recompense. She is my food, and I become her continuous food. So the thing that pleases me the most is meditating continuously on my passion. November 9th, 1909, Volume 9, Amusement of Jesus When the Soul Operates Together with Him. As I was in my usual state, I seemed to see our Lord extending his arms within me and playing with his hands a little sonata with an organ while being inside of me. Jesus amused himself in playing. I said to him, Oh, how well you amuse yourself. And Jesus, Yes, I do. You must know that since you have done your things together with me, that is, you have loved me with my love, you have adored me with my adorations. You have repaired me with my own reparations, and so with all the rest. Things are
are immense in you just as my own. And this union in operating has formed this organ. However, every time you suffer something more, you add one more key. And I immediately come to play my little sonata to see what sound this new key produces. And I enjoy one more amusement. Therefore, the more you suffer, the more harmony you add to my organ, and I amuse myself more. November 9th, 1910, Volume 10, Bad Effects of Human Works Done with a Human Purpose. Finding myself in my usual state, I was commending the many needs of the Church to my blessed Jesus. And Jesus told me, My daughter, the holiest works done with a human purpose are like cracked containers. If one pours any liquor into them, little by little it flows out to the ground. And when they go to get those containers in time of need, they find them empty. This is why the children of my church have reduced themselves to such a state, because in their works, Everything is human purpose. So, in needs, in dangers, in affronts, they have found themselves to be empty of grace, and therefore being debilitated, worn out, and almost blinded by the human spirit, they give themselves to excesses. Oh, how vigilant the leaders of the church should have been, so that I would not be made the laughing stock and almost the lid covering their wicked actions. It is true that there would be great scandal if they repented, but this would be a minor offense for me compared to the many sacrileges which they commit. Alas, it is too hard for me to tolerate them. Pray. Pray, my daughter, because many sad things are about to come out of the children of the church. And he disappeared. November 9th, 1925, Volume 18. Fusing oneself in the divine will is the greatest act, and the one which most honors our Creator. I was fusing myself in the holy divine volition according to my usual way, to then do my adoration to my crucified good. And since more than once, while doing my acts in the supreme volition, I had been caught by sleep, which would never happen before, I had not completed the first thing, nor done the adoration. So I said to myself, First I will do the adoration to the crucifix, and then if I'm not caught by sleep, I will fuse myself in the divine volition to do my usual acts. But while I was thinking this, my sweet Jesus came out from within my interior and placing his face close to mine told me, My daughter, I want you to fuse yourself in my will first, coming before the Supreme Majesty, to reorder all human wills in the will of their Creator, to repair with my own will, for all the acts of the human wills of creatures opposed to mine. Will came out of us, in order to divinize the creature, and will do we want. And when this will is rejected by them, to do their own will, it is the most direct offense to the Creator. It is to deny all the goods of creation and to move away from his likeness. And do you think it is trivial that, fusing yourself in my will, you place the whole of this will of mine as though on your lap, which, though it is one, brings its divinizing act to each creature? And reuniting all these acts of my will together, you bring them before the Supreme Majesty? To requite them with your will together with mine, with your love, redoing all the acts opposite of those of creatures? And do you press the same will of mine to surprise the creatures once again with more repeated acts, that they may know it, receive it, within themselves as prime act, love it, and fulfill this holy will in everything? 
The adoration of my wounds more than one does it for me. But giving me back the rights of my will has the prime act which I did toward man. This no one does for me. Therefore it is your duty to do it, as you have a special mission about my will. And if sleep catches you while you are doing it, our celestial father will look at you with love in seeing you sleep in his arms, seeing his little daughter who, even while sleeping, holds on her little lap all the acts of his will to repair them and requite them in love and give to each act of our will the honor, the sovereignty, and the right that befits it. Therefore, first fulfill your duty, and then, if you can, you will also do the adoration of my wounds. May Jesus be always thanked. Last night, by his goodness, I did both one and the other. November 9th, 1930, Volume 28 Difference Between Created Love and Creating Love Endowment with which God endowed the creature. Example I live amid continuous privations of my sweet Jesus. Ha, ah, without him I do not find my center toward which to take flight in order to rest. I do not find the guide whom I could trust. I do not find he who, with so much love, acting as my teacher, gave me the most sublime lessons. His words were rains of joys, of love, of graces over my poor soul. And now everything is profound silence. I would want the heavens, the sun, the sea, the whole earth to melt into tears, to cry over him whom I no longer find, and do not know where he turned his steps. But alas, no one points him out to me. No one is moved to pity for me. Ah, oh, Jesus, come back. Come back to her from whom you yourself said that you wanted no other than she live only for you and with you. And now, now everything is ended. My poor heart is full, and who knows how many things it wants to say of the pain it feels, of the privation of its Jesus, of its life, of its all. Therefore I move on and proceed. So while I was in the ardor of bitternesses, I was following the acts of the divine will. In one instant, everything was present to me, and my always lovable Jesus making himself seen, all tenderness told me, my daughter, courage, my love has no end, and therefore I love the creature with infinite and insuperable love. If you say that you love me, yet what difference is there between created love and creating love? An image of difference is given to you by the creation. Look at the sun. Its light and its heat fill your eye, invest your whole person. Yet how much light do you take? Very little, just a shadow of its light. And what is left of the light of the sun is so vast that it can invest the entire earth, symbol of your little created love, that, as much as you might feel yourself filled to the brim, is always little. The love of your creator, more than sun, remains always immense and infinite, and excelling over everything, it carries the creature in its triumph of love, making her live under the continuous reign of its creating love. Another symbol is the water. You drink it, but how much of it do you drink at all compared to the water that exists in the seas, in the rivers, in the wells, in the bowels of the earth? It can be said very little. And what is left of it symbolizes the creating love that by its own virtue possesses immense seas and knows how to love the little creature with immense love. Even the earth tells you of your little love. How much earth do you need in order to put your feet down? Just a little space. And what is left in abundance, oh, how much it is! So between the love of the Creator and that of the creature, there is a distant and immeasurable distance.
In addition to this, you must add that in creating man, the Creator endowed him with his properties. Therefore, he endowed him with his love, with his sanctity, with his goodness. He endowed him with intelligence and with beauty. In sum, we endowed man with all our divine qualities, giving him the free will to be able to put our endowment in circulation, expanding it more and more, according to how much more or less it would grow, placing also from his acts in our own divine qualities, as the task of work that he received, in order to preserve and expand for himself the endowment given by us. In fact, our wisdom, our infinite wisdom, did not want to issue the work of our creative hands, birth from us and our Son, without giving him from our own. Our love would not tolerate issuing him to the light of the day as stripped and without properties. It would not have been a work worthy of our creative hands. And if we had given him nothing, our love would not feel so drawn to love him. Because he is our own, he has from our own, and he cost our love so much. We love him so much, to the point of laying down my life. When things cost nothing and nothing is given, they are not loved. And it is precisely this that maintains the burning stake of our love, always ignited, always alive. Because much we gave, and still give, to the creature. Do you see, then, what great difference there is between the love of the creature and that of the Creator? If she loves us, she takes from our own properties given to her in order to love us. But even though the created love is little compared to the creating love, yet we want this little love even more. We long for it. We crave it. And when she does not give it to us, we go into a delirium. It happens to us as to a father who loves his son and endows his son with his properties. And this son, loving his father, very often takes the fruits of the properties given to him and sends them to his father as gift. Oh, how the father delights in receiving the gifts, though he does not need them. In the gift, he feels himself loved by his son. The gift is the speaking and operating love of his son, and the love of the father always grows toward him and he feels honored, satisfied, for having given his properties to the one who loves him and who nurtures the affection towards his father. But what would be the sorrow of this father would break the most sacrosanct of duties, the love between son and father, and would convert the joy, the happiness of paternity, into sorrow. More than father do we love the creature, and all our happiness is in being loved back. And if she does not love us, she would convert, if she could, our paternity into sorrow. Therefore, my daughter, the more you love us, the more gifts you send to your celestial father that are so very pleasing to us, because they are the fruits of our divine properties, given with so much love by your Creator. November 9th, 1931, Volume 30, How God Has the Acts of the Creature Established, Operating and Incessant Act of the Divine Will. One who does not do the divine will is left without mother and remains orphaned and derelict. My abandonment in the divine volition continues. Oh, with what tenderness it awaits me on its maternal lap to say to me, Daughter of my will, never leave me alone. Your mamma wants you together with her. I want your company in the sense that I do not leave them for one instant, because if I left them they would lose life. Yet there are those who do not recognize me. Even more they offend me, while I am all for them. Oh, how hard is loneliness! This is why I longed for you, my daughter. Oh, how dear to me is your company in my acts. Company renders the work sweet. 
it empties it of its weight and is the bearer of new joys. But while my mind was wandering in the divine will, my lovable Jesus making me his little visit told me, My daughter, my will is untiring, wanting to maintain the life, the order, the balance of all generations and of the entire universe. It cannot nor does it want to cease its work. More so since each motion is as though given birth by it and bound with inseparable bonds. An image of it is in the air that while no one sees it, yet gives birth to the breath in the creatures and is inseparable from the human respiration. Oh, if the air ceased its work of letting itself be breathed, the life of all creatures would suddenly cease. My will is more than air. The air is nothing other than the symbol, the image, and it produces the life of the respiration from the vital virtue of my divine will. While my will is life in itself, and uncreated. Now God has all the acts of creatures and the number of their acts established. So the commitment of these acts, because they are established by God, is taken by my divine will. It orders them and it places its life in them. But who gives the fulfillment to these acts established by the Supreme Being? one who cooperates with them and lets herself be dominated by the divine will. With the cooperation and with its dominion, she feels the bond and the inseparability from it and feels its divine life flow in her acts. On the other hand, when she does not cooperate, she loses the dominion of my divine will and instead of doing mine, she does her will and each act of human will forms a void for the divine in the soul. These voids disfigure the poor creature, and since she was made for God, he alone can fill these voids, because the acts, established in their number, were to serve to fill her with the divine being. Oh, how horrible are these voids! In them appear crooked ways, acts without divine origin and without life, Therefore there is nothing that ruins the creature more than her will. So, my will is operating and incessant act, inside and outside of the creature. But who receives its operative act? One who recognizes it in all of her acts. One who recognizes it, loves it, esteems it, appreciates it. By being recognized, my will makes one touch with one's own hand its operative and incessant act. And the creature feels its arms in hers, the power of its motion in hers, its vivifying virtue in her breath, the formation of its life in the beating of her heart. Everywhere, from inside, from outside, she feels herself being vivified, touched, embraced kissed by my will and my will as it sees that the creature feels its loving embraces clasps her more to its divine breast and keeps forming its sweet chains of inseparability between itself and its beloved creature by being recognized it feels as though repaid for its incessant work and with its power it removes the veil that kept it hidden from the creature, and it makes her know who it is that forms the life of all her acts. Therefore, the more you will recognize it, the more you will feel how much it loves you, and you will love it more. In addition to this, you must know that the soul without my divine will is like a flower that is picked from the plant. Poor flower! They took its life away because it is no longer bound to the root, and detached, it no longer receives the vital humors that circulated like blood and kept it alive, fresh, beautiful, fragrant, because it has lost the root that, like mother, loved it, nourished it, and kept it clasped to its breast. And while the root remains under the earth, 
as though buried alive to give life to the flowers, its children, and to let them make a beautiful appearance, so much so as to draw the human attention with its sweet enchantment. However, as the flower is picked from the plant, as if it had lost its mother, it seems to assume an attitude of melancholy. It loses its freshness, and it ends up withering. Such is the soul without my divine will. She detaches herself from the divine root that more than mother loved her, nourished her. And while it lives as though buried, it lives in all her acts and in the depth of her soul to administer to her the divine humors that it makes circulate like blood in all her acts in order to maintain her fresh, beautiful, perfumed by its divine virtues, so much so as to form the most beautiful and sweet enchantment for the earth and for the whole of heaven. So as she detaches herself from my divine will, she loses her true mamma, who with many maternal cares kept her safe, held her tightly to her breast, defended her from everyone and from everything, and she ends up becoming disfigured and withering to all that is good. And these souls come to feel the sad melancholy, for they live without she who generated them, without life, without the caresses of their mamma. So they can be called poor derelict orphans, without custody, and maybe in the hands of enemies and tyrannized by the passions of their own self. Oh, if the root had reason! How many excruciating cries of sorrow would it not emit in seeing the life of its flowers being snatched away, and itself being forced, like sterile mother, to remain without the crown of its children? But if the plant does not cry, my will cries in seeing so many of its children orphaned, but voluntary orphans who feel all the pains of orphanhood while their mother lives and does nothing but sadly miss and call the crown of her children around herself. End of November 9th Fiat